and welcome to Tools in the Shed, a podcast powered by Cars Guide, ready to rip into car stuff that has caught our eye this week. I'm Cars Guide Deputy Editor James, and with me is Senior Journalist Richard oh, hello. and regular contributor Peter. Thank Very you regular. both for being here. This week, we're looking at the next big thing, and it is big, uh, from China and how that wave continues to build into the Australian market. We'll look at some fresh metal in the Cars Guide garage, and we'll catch up with an alleged modern day robber baron in this week's Must Watch, so stay with us. But first of all, some feedback. Uh, Last week, we were looking at hot hatches, and I think it was a Stephen Otley story about should you be in the hot hatch market now or waiting because there's some interesting product coming down the pipeline. Um, Look, Jim Danik, our old mate, agrees with you, Richard, Uh, And he believes many motoring journalists that the Hyundai i30N is the pick uh, for performance and value and daily driving and all of that stuff. And he declares himself a Hyundai fanboy, so Mm. he's being quite transparent about that. Mm. Um, He thinks, yeah, that Evergreen is probably a good description for the Golf. Uh, Maybe it's respectful of its place in history. Um, His words, not mine, that that it might be (laughs) a little behind the times. Type R's too pricey. GR Yaris should keep all the manufacturers on on their toes. And he points out that we got a pricing story from Chesto this week. So in New Zealand, the GR Yaris in Kiwi pesos is going to be $54,990, which is about $50,720 in Australia. So more than $50,000 for a a GR Yaris is in prospect um, for this market. Cheaper than I thought it was going to be. Really? Still, still too much. Yep. Still way I was too thinking much. sixty. Well, give it you were thinking you were thinking sixty. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, thirty-two for a ZR hybrid. Outrageous yep. amount. That of is money. outrageous. That's yeah. too much money. No one's going to buy it. Well, yeah. Jim also chimed in and he caught the fact that we'd mentioned uh, Winton last time round, and he oh. said, oh, "Memories and a smiley face." And it's worth <laughs> pointing out that Jim is, of course, uh, formerly a key cog in the Winton yes. Motor Company machine. I think oh, Richard remind me he worked in the casting area and the and the engine plant. I think there was he did. that. He there did. was he... that unfortunate. He had a significant injury at one point. There was he that. Uh, well, I think it was hushed up by HR. He lost. He lost nine of his fingers, uh, JC, yeah. in a, yeah. um, in, a, in, a in a in a in a. It was just a. It was a horrific accident. He does. He um, does type one finger fast. That is well, his he style. Does, Very. But fast. he has eight fingers left, though, right? That's no. right. Yeah. Well, yeah. <laughs> No, actually, well, a lot of people don't know is that he, well, he cut his teeth doing the endurance rounds. Uh, he cut his teeth um, in as a well. Winton. He did Ow, <laughs> doing the wow. endurance rounds for that for was Winton. a that's a oh. anyway. Um, that's right. Lofty yeah. Visions uh, says top mm. show as usual, guys, with a thumbs up. Thank you, Lofty. Um, on hot hatches, have you guys heard any news on our great leader, the Musk's upcoming baby Tesla, uh, supposedly mm. to be priced around US twenty five thousand dollar mark. Uh, now, that would cause a bit of a stir in the hot hatch market. So stand by, cool. Lofty, because we're actually going to touch on that in Muskwatch this week. So just yep. hold that thought. Rico mm-hmm. says, I think it's a pity that the Civic sedan didn't get the Type R treatment. The old JDM FD2 Civic was brilliant and beautiful in Type R, guys. And for mm-hmm. our viewers on YouTube, we'll have a picture of that car. I've got to agree. Uh, with Rico, I think it is a beautiful car, and it didn't make it here. Mm. Um, although there may be some running around, private imports, etc. Mm. Mm. Um, Yamal Kumarasuri says, "Hi guys, would the new WRX be in the Golf R Yaris GRMN segment?" Segment. Now, first of all, I'd say that the GR is different to a GRMN. I think that's something that we're waiting for um, mm. in a little while. The MN GR stands for Gazoo Racing. Mm. And MN stands for Masters of Nürburgring. Um, so it, it's like the, the next level up in terms of uh, performance. But a WRX and a Golf R, I would have thought broadly, are, are um, competitive cars. What do you guys reckon? Peter? Uh, I, look, there's always threats of the WRX breaking out of that kind of uh, mid tier kind of thing, but like that's what the STI is for, right? And it's correct. It's too big. It's too big to be that kind of car. I yeah. don't think it's that kind of car at all. So, and I can imagine that the next WRX will be bigger and uglier again, and have the same engine and have <laughs> a terrible gearbox and have an awful ride. And then the STI will somehow have a better ride and a better gearbox, but still and looks nothing big. like the Visev concept. That's uh, right. Uh, Absolutely uh, nothing uh, like it. Ever, ever, ever since you know WRX lost its rival, the Lancer, 
Um, mm. It's never been, it's never had to up its game. No. So, um, and then it's, there's been a vacuum that's been filled, you know, by, you know, I thirties and, and, and whatnot. So oh, yeah. Yeah. yeah well, I mean, I, even the Renault Sport Megane um, yep. it just, just kills it. It's so much mm-hmm. more fun to drive. Yeah. 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 CVT, um, well, you know, Bertie, Bertie chimed in with his two cents worth and says he loves his Mark 7 GTI. So he has a Mark 7 Golf uh, GTI. No gremlins. Uh, the biggest plus, he reckons, is everyday usability. But he's not really excited by the Mark 8. Doesn't think it brings anything particularly new to the table. Talk about, you know, not, not evolving very far. And he even went as far as saying, what, what's the compelling reason to trade up? Even the new Tartan looks less GTI mm-hmm. than the current Clark version. I mean, he, should, he shouldn't be complaining too much. I mean, that means the resale value of his Mark 7 is going to be, you know, pretty good because the Mark 8 doesn't look too different. But that's a Volkswagen thing, isn't it, guys? Like, they make these yeah. tiny incremental changes, but they just refine and refine and refine. It's like when yeah. you're doing sanding, you just move up in a, in a, a, a smoother and smoother grade until you get to a, a really polished product. No, I actually yeah, but... get out the surfacer and just jam it in there <laughs> yeah. and go straight to the, the final result. Up. Yeah. So while while the Golf Mark Seven GTI is very very good, it's just mm. not. It's it's the same price as everything else. That's better than it. That's mm. the problem. Like even the Megane, right. which is expensive, right. I think yeah. is more fun, and it's got yeah. wheel steer and all of that. Whereas the Golf's just like, no, no, we're good. We'll just stick with the old formula. And if you're not going to push on while everyone else is is blowing past you, you just you're going to fall behind. It may still be a really good hatchback, and people buy. I think a lot of people buy the GTI because it's the top of the range and no other reason. But I just can't see why people are going to um, be attracted yeah. to it when it's just the same old, same old. Right. Do you think? Do you think it's been on, you know, on a pedestal for too long that Volkswagen's just rolling the arm over? Maybe. Can I just say, Golf GTI fanboys are almost as obnoxious as Tesla fanboys. Like, they are <laughs> super That's a provocative obnoxious. statement. Yeah, oh, look, you're, okay. you're going to get it now. Oh, so I don't care. I've, I've already got it. I mean, the yep. absolute, it, the, you cannot say that anything is better than a Golf GTI. Absolutely okay. nothing. You know. Check the comments so, for hate speech, everybody, I suppose. I mean, That's where we'll find it. You, yeah, could say, it. you could say the same about a Porsche 911 as well. The changes of, in that car over you know the last 10 years have been pretty incremental as well. So I, I disagree. I mean, what, I, would you cha- on, what would you change, Peter, about the GTI? What would I change about it? More power, more fun. How would you put more fun into it? Just make the chassis more playful. You make it part of the contract. Yeah. When you sign yeah, like, on to buy one, yeah, you're going to have more fun. The, it comes the, with the i30N cloud. is more fun yeah. to drive. It's sharper. It's more character. It doesn't. It's not as refined, like in terms no, but of I don't interior. Think people care about that. Honestly, you're not going to care. You're not going to cut yourself on any of the plastics in a in a Golf GTI. <laughs> oh, I'm <laughs> isn't that bad. <laughs> Well, I like the I'm I30N. I'm pretending the I30Ns, um, mm. but, but people who are looking for a hot hatch mm. aren't super far. I mean, people buy the Renault Sport Megane, and the quality on that is not exactly what you'd call, you know, Audi. So, mm. you know, I, I I just think that that buyer isn't isn't super fussed about the quality, but um, they're they're looking for something interesting to drive. And the fact yeah, that cool, the that's fair. I reckon, is yeah, that good? interesting. Yep. And maybe that's that's where the dichotomy is that mm. Volkswagen mm. is focused on stuff that people no longer really. Um, care that much about. Or it's just two buyers, isn't it? Mate? Yeah. Anyway. And look, you know, when, when I say Golf GTI fanboys, I'm mean <clears> the <throat> kind of prick from an internet forum type. It's not sure. people who just... <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, we'll leave that there. It'd be good to get people's further thoughts on all of that. But our old mate Hammer, Hammer Rock, hey! he's been, and in our comments, he's been um, a bit of a Defender fan and he's been looking forward to this new one. But he said the pricing that dropped um, since we last sat down... Uh, is where the good news stopped. <laughs> he said he knew it. Had, he, he knew it had cost more than the previous model, but geez, not nearly twice the price. So mm. you've got a spread of for a, a ninety P three hundred. That's the entry point at seventy one and a half before mm. on road costs. So that's your cheapest Defender, and you can go right up to a one ten in D three hundred X for one hundred and thirty five and a half. So you're you're in that band above 75k up to 135 odd. Um, he says Land Rover clearly sees the new Defender taking over the market that the current Discovery's failed to capture. Yeah, well, Discovery's gone up market, hasn't it? It's gone. It's more expensive than it used to be. And the Defender has it's... changed in character. It's a much slicker vehicle than oh. that, you know, iconic historical, you know, model that it replaced. 
Yeah. True, uh, but when w- w- was a defender ever recently bought and used as it should be in in a, in no. a previous generation as well? I think that they know their market very well. They're selling yeah, to good point. florists yeah, yeah, and yeah, yeah, you yeah. know people who have gourmet you know delivery businesses. It's, right. um, I, it's it's not it's not going to do the camel you know track tour across. That, the, that's a ve- that's know. a very narrow market, Richard. Gourmet <laughs> delivery businesses. If you're pitching your vehicle there, boy, <laughs> you know what I mean. Well, you are going to you are going to see it at the Chelsea Flower Show <laughs> with <laughs> Jamie Jury's name yeah, yeah. down the side of it. It's just yeah, it's yeah. a you know it's a fashion accessory. Now yeah. you know who bought mm. the last Defender towards the end. It was the same sort of people who bought Saabs because they couldn't buy a Saab. So they were buying that design icon, yes, probably without driving it on the road, yes. and um, yeah. uh, just discovering, oh, maybe this isn't cracked up to me. I've got a mate, yeah. like full on hipster beard, um, quaff, uh, like fantastic bloke, but he owned a Defender, and he said, mm. yeah, I didn't drive it that much, so I <laughs> it just yeah. wasn't that much. That much, that, and he also had a Saab, believe it or not. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Yeah, well, um, moving on, Birdie came in again and we were talking about the Citroen C5 Aircross uh, last Mm. week and one of its highlights being its seats, its fantastic seats. And Bertie says, remember the plush Renault 16 seats from the early 1970s? Magnifique, vive la France. (laughs) Um, So, and and look, my my brother, my Mm. older brother had a few Renault 16s and that is one of the things I remember about that car is how unbelievably great the seats were. He's absolutely Mm. right. Do you guys, either of you, had? did you, you owned a Renault, Peter, at one point, didn't you? I had a Renault Sport Clio, but my brother owned two Renault 12s. 12s. Uh, okay. And the tw- the second 12, the Virage, with the four headlight front end, uh, oh, yeah. had those lovely tombstone seats. Oh, they were beautiful. so yeah. comfortable, covered in, yep. oh, man, I guess it was Alcantara. Um, and the, the Alcantara was good because it gripped your clothes. So when you turned a corner, because like, those things, re- they'd roll yeah. over like a Liberian oil tanker, you know. Yeah. And, um, you... Peter, Peter enjoys having his clothes gripped. Yes. Well, you have Ooh. to in a Renault 12, otherwise you'd slide right out of the window. <laughs> very, very easy to work on mechanically as well. My grandfather yeah. was, a, was a Renault fan and he was terrible with engineering. But mm. even he could take an engine out of a Renault, fix it and put it back in again, all in his backyard. With well, a tree. It's meant, they're meant mm. for French farmers. They're yeah. meant, you know, yeah, it's right. transport plus taking the pig to market on the weekend. Now, you know, Bertie continues on saying, look, Richard, he picked up on your point last week from the Fortuna where you found the uh, Bluetooth connectivity or the connectivity for CarPlay very fiddly. And he says, yeah, it's annoying, uh, but it's also a safety issue because if that's on your mind and it's distracting you from what you're trying to do in operating the vehicle and being aware of what's around you, it is a bigger issue than it might seem on the face of it. So he he definitely agrees. Absolutely, absolutely. I had this issue where every time my wife called me in the Toyota that I was in, it actually disconnected the Bluetooth and the phone oh. just rang on the seat beside me. Yeah, so I was like, nice. so annoying. Oh, I can't touch the phone and she's ringing. I've got to pull over and then, you know, reconnect yes. my phone, you know, yep. that type of thing. And you, you I, and this is the thing. I mean, I think, then, I, you, I, then I mean, you have a fight. It and puts you a fight yeah, over it. She in jeopardy. I'm avoiding her. Um, yeah. Look, it's it's a Toyota and it's a Lexus thing. I end up, and this is the truth, and they're going to hate me saying this. I end up just not really using their media systems because yeah. it's just too much work, and it's, right. they're, they're messy, right. um, they're busy, they're difficult to get around. Yeah, it's they, that's and in one Lexus, area they need to fix. Lexus mm-hmm. world, you're using the remote touch interface, which is probably the most hateful thing oh. in the world. <laughs> oh no, yeah. there are worse. I think the Toyota right. head units are criminally bad for such a big right. company right. there's yeah. no need right. for it but is it because they're i mean i mean they're obviously i've just got out of a kia sorento which i'll talk about later and the, the seamlessness of yes. you know kia and also hyundai's and connectivity is amazing right. um you know it yeah. connects to your phone before you even touch the door handle type of thing as you're yeah. walking over to it it's brilliant <laughs> right. Um, right. Is it because, I mean, Toyota's obviously getting a third party to, to, to come up with, you know, their headsets or their head, their oh, head no, units? I think it's even lamer than that. I think yeah. it's even lamer than that. I reckon they're just buying them off the shelf. So I, I've often... JB hi fi JB hi fi We're down to that level, I reckon. I've often yeah. joked that some accountants got smashed and bought 5 million units <laughs> off, yeah. off Alibaba. Um, yeah. Be, because, like the, the new one's slightly yeah. better, but the yeah. quality of the screen itself is shocking. 
It's like it's all stretched across. It's low res. There's no color depth. Yep. Step into a Kia. You step into a Kia Picanto, okay. and the screen is yes. miles better than in a seventy five thousand dollar yep. car. It's yeah, just right. not good enough. Right. Right. Yep. Right. Yep. Yep. Okay. So great point. Great point, Bertie. And uh, we He's wholeheartedly right. agree. Yeah. Uh, let's see if has a relative that has the last model VW Jetta um, that was sold here. And strangely enough, they want to upgrade to another one. But of course, it departed the scene in, I think, 2017 and asks, is there any chance that the Jetta would make a reappearance in this market? And I think that just goes to the fact that sedans full stop mm -hmm. are kind of on the nose and in, in a terminal slide to, to nowheresville. Um, mm. And the chances are exceptionally thin that that would ever happen. Do you guys yep. agree? Agreed. I think so. I mean, uh, yeah, look, it's, it's hard to get a small sedan um, from the, the Volkswagen group. You know, Skoda does the Scala, but it's a hatch. Um, mm. Look, I mean, I mean, why not? Yeah. What is it? I would like to know, what is it about the Jetta that they really like that they can't get out of a hatch? Is it just because it's yeah. a sedan or what is it? Good point. Don't know. Yeah. Don't know. I mean, um, let's see if ads that um, when they, he was looking at that car and his relative... Um, his relative's wife, and they were showing it off to him, and he said, well, you do know it's made in Mexico. And he said, <laughs> if, if, if looks could kill. <laughs> uh, so he's a bit cheeky there. Um, now, Neza, on the same... They even make the Jetta in right-hand drive anymore. Sorry, sorry, James. Okay, well, there you go. That's, that's a massive tick in the impossible col uh, column there. Yeah. Um, so Neza, uh, he, on that same theme, says he believes sedans will truly die out when... Taxis, police, government and businesses in general move away from them. He's in Tassie and he says that over there they're using 2014 Honda Jazz hybrids as taxis, uh, which was a shock to the senses when he first arrived. <laughs> They've got very good seating. They've got plenty of leg room and, plenty of and room. surprisingly yeah. big boots. Um, yeah. Yep. yeah. They're a packaging um, but, miracle, the Jazz and the HRV. Have you done the um, what's the you know they got they call it magic seating? But have you done the one? If you go through the manual, it tells you all the different types of seating arrangements you can do. Have you done the one where you put the front seat back and you sit in the back seat and you put your legs over the top <laughs> of the front seat and they call it the refresh mode? Yeah, and all it is, refresh and mode. It's, it's just it's just a Japanese <laughs> Honda executive, like complete. It's complete bullshit. You're just sitting in the back seat with your legs over the front seat. They yeah, do that in all cars. It's high tower from um, flying high. Uh, <laughs> yeah, right, uh, right. Police academy. <laughs> Well, that's yeah, where they got the idea because that was a Honda Civic that they ripped that seat out. There you out go. Of. There, there you, you go. go. You, you sense there's just a touch of opportunism there. Oh, look, oh, you can do this. Let's call it what was it? Relax mode. Relax mode. Yeah, relax yeah. Mode. yeah. Awesome. <laughs> well, Grudlin seventy four uh, finished it off with the comments. He says the belie he believes the death of sedans is not far away, and really it's about EVs and there being two schools of thought, like hatches and um, SUVs, in terms mm. of non commercial vehicles. Um, efficiency is no longer just about A to B commute. It's the space that we occupy while doing it. And he thinks sedans are very space inefficient. And that Lofty Visions responded to that and said another sedan bit the dust recently in Australia, which, of course, is the Liberty. And um, we ran the story this month that um, as of, uh, well, the latter part of this year and early next year, we, we won't have the Liberty anymore. And it's been um, mm. an absolute part of the landscape. scenery in the Australian yeah. landscape for so long. And it'll be gone. But I mean, it, like, sedans have been on this. I mean, really, when you think about it, like the, the Liberty RS was kind of the hero car of the 90s. Mm. And you, you can't get a sedan in that size with that kind of oomph anymore. No. So it, mm. it's, it's like, it's not just that the market shrunk, it's that the appeal for car makers to make them interesting is also shrunk, mm. That's which is probably true. accelerating their demise. I reckon we're going to go full circle. Because if you have a look at the very first cars that came out in mm. 1890s, which were yeah. based on horse and buggies, we're going to end up with four giant wheels <laughs> and an open top and you just climb in and there's no boot. You just, I reckon we've just gone, we've just realised we had it right the first time. <laughs> we had it totally right. They were the original. We started with SUVs because they were off-roaders because their roads were terrible. We're just going to go all the way back. We got it right the first um, time. Richard, I, I don't agree. But anyway, that's a, that's a, a very interesting uh, point of view. You what? Um, it's going to happen. But we, will, we will move on from there to our, our main topic of conversation for this week. 
which is ostensibly around one car's coming arrival, but also points to a slightly larger conversation about mm. the continuing wave of success or the wave of new models and the success that they're enjoying mm. in Australia, the cars coming from China. Um, and we ran a, a Chesto authored story this week about a new product from MG that's called the Gloucester. And it first saw light of day earlier this year at an auto, a thing called Auto Expo in India um, earlier on. It's more powerful than a Prado, more tech savvy than a Fortuna, according to Chesto. But it's a ladder frame, seven seat, all wheel drive uh, SUV. So, and it will come in at a keen price, you'd have to think. Mm. Um, so, just to put some context on this, MG. So far this year, uh, the HS is doing 250 odd a month. Mm. The MG3 is up 70% year mm. on year. Uh, the ZS is doing well. That's a you know, relatively recent arrival. And in a market that is down 20% year to date, new car mm. market in Australia, LDV's up close to 10%. Great Wall is up 22%. MG's up 60%. And Havel is up close to 100%. Yeah. While all the established brands are, some of them are doing well to just tread water and, and, and stay in station. Others are suffering very badly. The Chinese brands have found their, their time. I think well, I that's think, right. So, but I think there's a, there's a key kind of point to, to consider here. One of them is that one of the reasons Toyota is down 20, 25% is that the commercial market is tanked. So Hilux is down vans and yep. that kind of thing and that's you know that's a big chunk of toyota sales and that's no criticism of either of those vehicles it's just that nobody's buying them yep. whereas the mg stuff it's all private yeah people are going and putting their hands mm. in their own pockets <clears throat> they're not yep. looking for you know government rebates or any of that it's not for their job people are going and buying private cars from mg and that is you know that's why the mg3 is up so much and it like off a low base is a backhanded way of saying well, sure. they were crap to start with but they were doing all right last year so they were the, that's the, the thing the rise is is more than just coming off a low base. I mm. think it's just quite it's it's more stark because of the tanking in the market. But I think those numbers would be consistent even if the market was still blazing away like it was in the last few years. Yeah. Do you mean do you think as well that it's um they're offering such an affordable price? Yeah, it's so I mean DMG three. Yeah. There's I'm always looking. gonna be a part of the market that yeah. will take the bait when you're yep. offering a very attractive price so for I'm a looking new car. At, I'm looking at those sales in the in the light vehicle class, MG3 654 for the last month, mm -hmm. and the nearest competitor is Kia Rio at 445, so 654 yeah. compared to 445. They are smashing it. Well, um, I suppose I suppose what you sh what what's worth saying is that in that part of the market where people are possibly buying their first new car um, yeah. there's mm. less chance that they're going to be rusted on loyal to a particular brand. That's right. Absolutely. Much at all as you, you, you'd like to start young car buyers on the, the ladder of your brand, um, at that point, they're probably ready to look anywhere. They don't have much prejudice mm. in terms of I'm against this brand or for that one, and they're much more open to the idea of a car like an MG at a really aggressive price. Well, look at the competition. Mazda mm. 2, all over 20 grand. Yep. Yaris starts at 21 one yes. with a stripped out manual. Yep. Um, you've got uh, the Rio, which is great, but it was just being turned over to the new model. Uh, what else is kicking around? Picanto. Like, Picanto. So Picanto is the only real kind mm. of solid, yep. low yep. price. And it's a um, great little car. It yep. is so good. Yep. Um, I mean, I always point people towards the GT, especially if they're happy to yeah. drive a manual. It's, it's like, huge, why fun. wouldn't it's you? It's great. Yeah. Yeah, mm. um, but MG is is throwing an automatic at a market that wants it uh, for a good price. They look shiny and new when you walk into them. Yep. Um, mm -hmm. The dealerships look good. It's a it's a brand that probably their parents, because well, they're going to be my age and Richard's age, you know, for a lot of these people if yep. they're not going young. They're like, yeah, hey, it's, a great, it's a great brand when I was a kid, you know. Yeah. So yeah, even though I they've think, got their well, I mean, them now. M MG is shamelessly playing on that heritage and saying yeah. MG since 1924. Um, you know, and, oh. and all of that stuff. Even uh, in terms of the naming of this new SUV, which is the Gloucester, which is named after the Gloucester Meteor, which yeah. was the very first 
Royal Air Force, a British Air Force jet fighter to fly in World War Two. Uh, on, yeah, only jet plane to fly in World War Two. That's right. I was watching videos of it this morning because I'm a nerd. And yeah. Yeah, seriously, if you saw this thing flying over a battlefield, you would be like, me, what the <laughs> heck is that? Of course, it's right. that, it goes... And the noise, yeah. And it's yeah, just yeah. like nice. brilliant. Like, meanwhile, you've got other planes going. <laughs> and you can see them. <laughs> it's incredible. Um, right. So, yeah, they, they know what they're doing in terms of their naming. Yes. Um, so, yes. look, I think this is. I, look, if you had have asked me about a year ago, I'd say no way. There's no way it can take off. But I think if I think they if they price this Gloucester at a at a at a low enough price you are going to get people buying it because it looks good. Yep. Um, it's got it's the only SUV in this market at this yep. minute price point to have a 12.3-inch media display. 12.3-inch media display. It's enormous. Monster. And a big sunroof. Monster. All those, all those it, things. Yes. It was like when um, Great Walls started to first come into the market and yep. they had leather. You yeah. know, it, it, in yeah. your starting model, it, it yeah. sort of threw things out of whack in terms of expectations yeah, yeah, of what yeah. should be included in a base model car. Yeah, what the Chinese are going to do here is they are going to completely dazzle younger buyers with the like the most modern tech, really cool styling, all these value for money features like leather seats, and they'll they'll, they'll throw it head in head up displays. Yeah. Meanwhile, you've got Prado, which looks like it's straight out of nineteen ninety nine. Oh, um, it's they they are going to Toyota. Don't know what's going to happen, but I think they they they. <laughs> it's well, too Chesto, late to Chesto dug around mm. and he, he um, at this point, believes there'd be a choice of engines, but mm. that it would launch with a two-litre twin-turbo diesel, mm. which would be good for 162 kilowatts and 480 newton metres. Yes. And an, an all-wheel drive system mm. um, that, you know, by the way, sorry, that makes it more powerful than Fortuna, Prado, or the five-cylinder Everest, mm -hmm. um, so that that would be a bit of a march on the market. Eight-speed auto, yep, um, and the twelve-point-three-inch screen you mentioned, Richard. Yep, yep. Uh, a big panoramic sunroof, digital yep. driver display, yep, uh, AED, ventilated front seats, collision up warning, on it's autonomous got... parking. We've got yeah. some footage of that um, as well. That it'll yeah. do the parking trick, um, and it's about five meters long, so it's a decent-sized beast mm. uh, with seven seats. People are going to buy it. I mean, I think I think the brand snobbery, which existed, you know, in you know in the, in the eighties and the nineties and the early two thousands, is going. I think. Yep. I think people are going to are, are buying with their eyes. Um, it's going to sell. I know it is. Yeah. It really is. Well, the, the the thing is, it's for the Indian market mm. at this stage, and it's going to cost the equivalent of seventy five thousand Australian dollars um, yep. in India. Um, the specification may well be different by the time it comes here. But yep. you'd think it's only a matter of time. I reckon it's a no-brainer for MG to move from the, the smaller hatch-type vehicles into, into something like this. Easily. Yeah. Well, India has just lost um, Toyota Prado uh, because right. of fuel oh. regulations over there. So this, okay. this, is, this is coming in to fill that vacuum. And okay. so it's going to – it's going to oh, – they're going to love it. Um, yep. It's so also, I mean, the Indians are pretty happy with it because it's, yeah, it's got ventilated seats and it's a really big feature over there. They they want luxury SUVs, which have got all those, you know, you know, plush features. So it'll yep. it'll sell their like. I mean, it's packs. broadly based mm -hmm. on the LDV D90, which is mm -hmm. a known quantity here. Mm -hmm. So it wouldn't be kind of breaking as much ice as you'd think. Um, that that there's already been a little bit of groundwork laid in terms of acceptance for for yeah. this kind of vehicle from China. Absolutely, number of LDV, you know, vehicles that you're seeing on the streets, tradies are getting into yep. the Utes. They're all like it's accepted. It's Good. yeah. The Good. only thing that's going to stop it would be a war with China, but I don't think that's going to happen. <laughs> Fine, <laughs> not if we've got a herald to deal with it. Um, now, <laughs> the herald um, son would like a war. Yeah, yeah. So we'll yeah. leave that there. It would be nice to know if people would be, you know, tempted by uh, a vehicle like the Gloucester. Is that something that you could see you, yourself choosing rather than a Prado? Um, that's got so much kind of following in this market. Be interesting to know. You know but what I think is interesting about that part of the market. Sorry, just to finish yeah, off, go for is it. that I think that part of the market is quite happy to dip its toe into something new. Like, like the the big SUV market has been happy. Like, took on the Isuzu um, brand with great enthusiasm, which at the time it got kicked off was not really a known quantity for that kind of car. Yeah. Um, as you say, they bought Great Walls. They bought LDVs. People buy Sangyongs. Like, yes. 
Yeah. It's yeah. not like – like, people are brave in that segment, which I think is really interesting. Um, That's a good point, yeah. 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 Anyway. That is a good point. Now, um, thank you for that, guys. And as I say, love to hear people's thoughts on all of that. But, Richard, we're going to move to our garage now. Yes. And we're going to start with you. And for the second week in a row, you've been driving, testing, reviewing uh, a very significant vehicle. So tell us about it, please. I have been driving uh, the – well. Because we don't have proper launches at the moment because of COVID-19, um, the launches are being done in a different way. We're picking the cars up. We're sitting through a sort of a webinar and the Kia Sorento has just turned over to its new generation model. So I've been driving the new generation uh, Kia Sorento. Um, it's, um, I've had it a week. I put about 200 Ks on the clock. Um, there's a video on YouTube and the Cars Guide website at the moment. Um, it is um, look. The Sorento has always been a, been a been a benchmark for that that seven seat SUV market for the for, in terms of value for money, um, in terms of the way it drives and practicality and um, and I, you can read the review, but they've done it again. Um, yeah, it's, it's, have, it's, they? it's yeah. they've just made it. They've made it better. Um, so I, so I look. I guess better. the the the. I'll start with the bad points. The bad points are the the, the engines. Um, they still offer pretty much. They're they're the same engines. I mean, the okay. the diesel now has an aluminium block rather than a cast iron one, but it's still the same capacity and the outputs are the same. Um, the fuel the, f- the fuel economy is a little bit better. Um, the other the alternative to that is a V six petrol, um, and we didn't drive that one. We drove the diesel and we drove the top of the range GT line. Um, Look, the, the V6 is going to be really thirsty. It would have been right. so much better for a car that feels this modern um, and, and that looks this stylish yes. to have had a, like a, a turbo petrol high output four cylinder like that's in the Mazda CX-9. It just yep. would match this yep. car completely. Yep. Instead, we've got these engines which are which are pretty old and and, and pretty thirsty. But then um, on the plus side of the ledger, there's so much oh, which... Wow. On the oh, plus yeah. side of the ledger, look, what a car. safety is fantastic, but I've got to point out that the airbags don't fully cover the third row. Um, but right. then again, those those third row seats still aren't... You know, not your Kia Carnival seats. They are temporary or, you know... Jump seats. Occasional yeah. jump seats, that's right. Right. Um, but the, the top of the range GT line just gets oodles and oodles of technology. We were talking about connectivity before um, and what they've got up front is a 10.25 inch screen and it is, it's the best media display I have ever used from yeah, wow. the the styling to the icons to even when you're not in um, sat nav, look on sat nav, there's this street light mode. So you might just have it off and it just follows where you're going on, 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 the, on the screen. <laughs> oh, that's great. And it's really not intrusive. It just shows you your street and the side streets and it's so uh, clever, so, clever, which clever. Is very, very similar to the central screen in the BMWs. Um, yes. That, that kind yeah. of vibe. But it's it's really yeah. handy. I, I was thinking, why is this? Why is it like this? But it's because you can see little side streets if you need yeah. a little quick rat run. It's so, so good. good. Yeah. For real. The diesel has now got a, um, a dual clutch. It's a wet, it's a wet clutch. And it's and it's superb. Uh, Amazing, so it? yep. it's not as fast shifting as say a DSG from Volkswagen, but it's seamless in terms of that low speed bumper to bumper traffic. It's yep. just it's so and, good. And diesel is all wheel drive. Petrol's front wheel drive. That's it. So oh, if you want to if you want all wheel drive, you're going to have to go for the diesel. All petrol's a front wheel drive. Um, look, you can watch the review, but I've got to, I've got to say it's got one standout feature, and that's again on the top of the range car. And it's able to park itself in and out of spots. Now, yeah, it, it's you're thinking, well, yeah, uh, that's that's not new, right? All you Volkswagens, Audis have all got the you know the self parking feature, but this parks itself when you're not in the car. So yes. how it works is, is you arrive at your parking spot, and the cars on either side have just parked too closely for your whole family to get out um, before when you've parked it. So you get out of the car before you've parked it, and then on your key fob, it, it's like a remote control, and there's a forward and a reverse button. You press the forward button, and it steers itself into the spot. And so it uses the sensors and the steering to actually get itself in, and it works the reverse as well. So you get back to your spot, and you know someone's parked you in. So you press it in reverse. You can automatically start the car so you don't have to get in it from the key fob and then press the reverse button and it will it, it will navigate its way out of there as well. It's amazing. It's brilliant. Which is a, it's kind brilliant. of along the road to a Tesla summon thing, isn't it? Yeah. But, yeah. You know, yeah. where you, you're getting the car to do what you want without being in it. 
Exactly. It probably won't right. and, itself into an and old on a um, on a completely subjective level, I think inside and out, it looks fantastic. I, I does, love the it? way it looks. I really it, do. They've done a does. great job. They've completely changed the look of it. The last one was a bit bloated, you know, a little Fusty bit like looking, I was it? a couple of years ago. <laughs> and it has, just like me, it's it's lost a little bit of weight, and it, you know, well, unlike me, it looks a lot better. Um, <laughs> Prices have gone up about three grand, so it starts. It, it tops out at the GT line for about sixty three thousand, and begins yep. Yep. in the forties as well uh, for the for the lower grade models. So it's a good thing, a really good I would, thing. I would say, don't ignore that bottom of the, that entry level car because you don't get the big screen, you don't get a lot. Yeah, of so step up the from sport. the sport. Yeah, from the sport yeah, yeah. upwards. It's just, it's just so so I've, good. I I've highly done, recommend I've, it. I've done and, a few miles in that same car, and I am so impressed with it. It's I would, so I would yeah. also highly recommend people watch Richard's video. It is a cracker. Definitely. So there you Good go. Video. Now, um, <laughs> early on, we had Bertie talking about Renault sixteen seats and how good they were. Uh, but Peter, you've been in a French vehicle, a current have. model, yeah. a different brand, but fill us in. Yeah, uh, so Peugeot three thousand eight, uh, which I have a soft spot for. You know, just from the get go, I had one for six months for Cars Guide. Uh, in the diesel GT line. I had the petrol GT line, and I've got to say, everything I loved about that car is even better in the in the GT line petrol. Even though it's a bit slower, it's just a nicer engine. It's got that turbo petrol. It's just a nicer car to drive, and I, re- okay. I just like the Sorento. It's gorgeous to look at. It's a real yep. piece of art. Uh, someone actually said, is that the new Evoque? <laughs> I went, <laughs> Wow. That's probably pushing it a bit much. But it has that wow. really, yeah. uh, uh, really nice style to, styling to it. It doesn't, it, you know, because some SUVs, but they all look the same. So the Peugeot's got this really nice detailing, all those metallic features, and the inside is just so cool. Uh, and nice. I know Richard hates the um, the eye cockpit driving style, oh. but that's because he's nine meters tall. So <laughs> don't know that what Richard says. Um, I really like it, um, and it's just such a lovely like. The media system could do with work still. You have to sometimes when you, you know, you've got your phone plugged in, but you've got yeah. to actually pull it out of the USB and put it back in. Little niggly things like that still happen, but I'm still, uh, I'm still in love with the three thousand eight. I just think it's lovely. But fantastic. The only more comfortable seats I've driven in in the last couple of months were in the C three Aircross, which has yes. fantastic seats from the. Cactus. I love it. Yeah. Does can, Peter tell me? Does the instrument cluster have the Taco and Speedo as those like those those rings that yeah, rotate. so it's multi. Well, you got multi choice, so yeah, you can of slip you through. Do. And I really like it when it starts up. It does this kind of funky animation, uh, <laughs> and you can flip through it, and, and it animates into the next thing rather than just yeah. going flick. It yeah, animates the next time it's. it's I, do, I, I, I forget which car designer it was. I apologise. That said, screens and lights are the new Chrome. Yeah, absolutely. The the. Well, that yeah. kind of bling is what's engaging people with car design. Yeah. And Peter, Peter, what about the um, – Doesn't it? What about yeah. the shifter in it? You feel like you're holding the muzzle of a greyhound, though. It's like... <laughs> How often do you hold the muzzle of a greyhound? <laughs> well, greyhound you... I'm holding one right now, actually. <laughs> uh, it is a little yeah, bit Yeah, what like about that. the greyhound? <laughs> now, to say it. now, I don't <laughs> – I don't like. I don't mind it, but my wife doesn't like that shifter. So it, it's split down the middle in this house. Right, <laughs> we've broken Richard. <laughs> All right. Now look, I'll I'll finish off the oh. the garage entries with uh, the Audi TT, which is a car I haven't been in for a while, for whatever that's worth. But it's the forty five TFSI Quattro S line. Nice. So that's best part of eighty thousand dollars before you put it on the road. Uh, and the car that we've had is uh, white, a very striking white colour. People on YouTube be able to see some pics. So it's two litre turbo four, six speed dual clutch, and all wheel drive, of course, with the Quattro. 169 kilowatts, 370 newton meters, which is plenty for a little car like that. Yeah. And on the plus side, I had the seats are terrific. They're not French style seats. They're, what I'm trying to say is they're very grippy. And supportive without being uncomfortable. They're they're super good in that regard. Um, the ergonomics, the performance, it really gets along pretty rapidly. It's really urgent in its performance. Um, the dynamics, the quality, and the value, I would say, because mm. even at that money, it is getting mm. on for half the price of a TTRS. And and yeah. I reckon in day-to-day driving, it's just about all the TT you're gonna need. 
Can I um, mention something? Yep. Safety, JC, safety. Oh. No AEB. Fine. That's in my negative <laughs> column. You just you read my mind. So uh, number yeah. one in the yeah. minus column, no yeah. AEB. Yes, yeah, so the uh, the rear seats, it's it's called a plus two. No, nah, nah, no, no way. Yeah. You, nah. you, you with the best will in the world, you can't get real people into those back seats. They're they're not real. Yeah. Um, the yeah, multimedia in, in the instrument cluster, I'm not convinced by that. Um, that that you're choosing media things and whatever in the middle of the instrument to play in, uh, do, display in front of you. Oh, um, I'm, I'm not a fan. Others may be. I, I don't particularly enjoy that setup. Um, cabin storage was pretty thin on the ground. There wasn't a lot of places to put things easily. And despite a hill hold function, I did suffer a bit of rollback occasionally with the, with the dual clutch, which I find disconcerting. So, mm. But overall, I reckon even at that money, relative to the RS, which of course is a a real powerhouse, but this car was heaps of fun to drive during the week. I really enjoyed it. And I think that car is more livable than the RS. Oh, uh, yeah. the RS is full on. Yeah, you've got to be yeah, ready for like, that. It's more it's more a special event kind of car, you know, oh, when you, like, you really yeah. want to go off and have a drive. Um, oh, yeah, this yeah, it's, this yeah. one you can um, live live with more. I mean, yeah. I love the I love the five cylinder in the RS. It's a <laughs> it's my favorite Audi yeah. engine. Isn't it a sure, great sure, engine? Sure, yeah, yeah. Great. sure. But um, yeah, yeah, the RS is. I reckon, yeah, you you got to be committed <laughs> to yeah, have that yeah. car. Super committed. <laughs> well, speaking of being super committed, it's time for must watch. <laughs> Oh, yeah. But do you mean committed in a um, lunatic asylum? <laughs> a legal like? sense. Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah. Now, first of all, you'll remember Lofty Visions in the feedback that we covered off earlier asked us about what's happening with the Tesla hot hatch. And pretty recently, and they're not too dim distant past, on Twitter, there was some reaction to Volvo buying a Model Y. They bought it in, in July, and there was much, oh, Volvo's trying to copy Tesla or, gee, they... They need to deconstruct this vehicle. Um, but in the commentary on that in Twitter, uh, a person, Janius Kapkan, said Model Y is still too big for some cities in Europe. What about a smaller European-style hatchback? And Elon chimed in and said, probably a good one to design and engineer in Germany. Because, of course, the Gigafactory in Berlin is being mm -hmm. built as we speak. It's probably pretty close to, uh, to being finished off. So Electrek, um, the website Electrek, uh, said that reminded us that Elon's been discussing building cars, uh, sorry, designing cars where they're building them. So in China, for example, he's built new factories and he wants to design cars in China for China primarily. Mm. And mm. so he's seeing the German Berlin factory as, yeah, not just a place to build cars, but he's said that he's going to set up a design studio, uh, a European design centre in Germany as well. So mm. it got me digging around for what might be out there already Mm. And I found on Pinterest this mob called Yanko Design. I reckon go to their website. It's really mm. a pretty interesting place to visit. And a particular designer called Dijan Christov mm. has come up with a whole series of what he's calling Model C uh, renders uh, for a, a prospective small hot hatch style Tesla. He says, mm. I love me a hatchback and I love me a Tesla. And this is, yes. this is what he's been uh, designing, and I just reckon they're fantastic. It's obviously easy to make a car look great when you're not constrained by bean counters telling you that, you know, no, sorry, that's not doable for the price. But he's got um, all-glass top. He's got motorised oversized side doors that slide forward, you know, um, Oh, 60s yeah. um, concept car style, really Porsche cool. 107 style, yeah. Exactly. So we've got some pictures up for people watching on oh. YouTube, but if you're not, head to Yanko Design and have a look because I reckon they're amazing. Jake, yeah. um, and Peter, I think we yeah. should contact Elon and say, look, come to Australia, build a factory here and build a car for Australians. Well, yeah. he's got a whole, uh, he's got yeah. Yu Yangs. I mean, um, yeah. Yankars just bought Yang, uh, Lang Lang, yeah. so he can buy he's, Yu um, He's intimidated by Winton. He's intimidated. He knows, <laughs> he knows that there's no chance. What about a panel van? What about a Tesla panel van? Tesla panel van. The tenel, Tesla the te van. The Tesla yeah. P. Yeah. Well, there was that woman in the States that bought the uh, made the Tesla Ute, yeah? 
yes. uh, Mortal, Mortal 3 Ute, which was pretty yeah. good. It was, yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> but al- also on Twitter, a person called Robert Reich, who our US listeners may be aware of, um, was on the Twitters. He's Chancellor, uh, Chancellor's Professor of Public Policy at the University of California at mm. Berkeley. He was a Secretary of Labor in the Clinton administration. He's written 17 books. He's all over it. He's a big voice wow. um, in, in public policy. So he tweeted, Tesla forced all workers to take a 10% pay cut from mid-April until July. In the same period, Tesla's stock skyrocketed and CEO Elon Musk's net worth quadrupled from $25 billion to over $100 billion. Musk is a modern-day robber baron. Mm-hmm. Just came right out with it. Elon came back and said, all Tesla workers also get stock, so their compensation increased proportionately. You are a modern-day moron. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, says the guy who called a pedo uh, online. Yeah. I just thought that was yeah. awesome. And everybody piled in. Turnell Henry says, in other news, companies don't care about workers as long as they generate profit. Also, water is wet. So <laughs> that's, that's a fair call. Yeah, but Lee Volrath said, how exactly is the rise and fall of a stock price supposed to make up for forced closures impacting cash flow yeah. that covers pay? The two are not d- directly related. The fact the company stayed healthy improved their job security better than other employers. Mm. Now, there were some accusations that people had been let go from Tesla just before they reached their work birthday threshold where shares would have vested and, yeah, and all of yeah. these things. So really? there's allegations of some dodgy behaviour in, in downsizing the workforce. But, but Doc Holliday came out with a fantastic GIF uh, meme of Shaq when he was playing for the LA Lakers Mm. Slam dunking on Chris Dudley, who was um, a player for the New York Knicks, and just pushing him into the ground. So really, they're saying Elon did a slam dunk on Robert Reich, and I think they're probably pretty right. So this is really standard behaviour of Silicon Valley douche bro companies. Totally. So, you know, years ago, I worked for a large Silicon Valley company that had a lot of money. They used to get you to lend them money when you went traveling. So it's like, here's a credit card, but it's your credit card. So if we don't pay it, that's on you. But also, um, they gave you these stock options, which vested over over a certain period of time. And when I got to my first tranche, they went, oh, no, you didn't start in August. You started in December. And then between August and December, wow. the, the stock price tanked. So I lost any gain I got out of it, and I'm not the only one. And this is just standard wow. Silicon Valley nonsense. It's garbage. I mean, I mean, I mean, I'm happy to put my hands up and say I'm an old lefty, but um, to say that stock options is part of your compensation is is rubbish. It might yeah. be for someone like you know, the CEO, because they're already getting a ton of money. Yeah. And, you know, you look at someone like Qantas's Alan Joyce. Oh, it's, he gets paid $28 million a year. Well, he doesn't, but a big chunk of that is stock options. That stock is not options. compensation. It's like the bonus I used to get when I worked for one tell, which was, which was just given if the manager felt like it. It meant they couldn't, didn't have to pay as much super. So that stuff's rife and it's gone. Yeah. Yeah. Well, interesting. Um, get off my horse now. <laughs> 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 also, also on Twitter, in, in a more conventional style, if there is such a thing for the dear leader, mm. he tweeted, a la guerre comme a la guerre, which translated from French is in war as in war. Now, I, uh, couldn't, I couldn't attribute, I couldn't find an attribution for that anywhere particularly. Gump. But Arnold Mahusa <laughs> said, in, in response, Arnold Mahusa it. said, you all right? Sometimes <laughs> it's all right to listen. You'll be shocked to find that there's always sense amidst all the chaos. Cheers. And, <laughs> and then Fernando <laughs> said, Elon, did you say you like pizza with extra cheese? And <laughs> crack, daddy, crack Daddy of Cam crack came daddy in with, awesome. Elon, on some shit. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> um, but the share price, the share price is pretty mm. telling. Um, yeah. It's as we speak, three hundred and sixty-six dollars twenty-eight cents. Oh, that's uh, down a or, lot. When I when I checked in on it um, just in the last twelve hours or so, mm. and it was four hundred and forty-seven dollars and thirty-seven cents last week. So it's down about eighteen percent. Yeah, and it was down twenty percent or eighty-two billion dollars on Tuesday. So wow. there are a few reasons for that. Um, mm. According to IG uh, website and their author Shane Walton. 
there's general market weakness, particularly across um, tech stocks. Uh, Apple's down 15%, Microsoft's down 10%, Amazon's down about 9%. So there's that. Uh, but also Tesla's exclusion from the S&P, the Standard & Poor's 500, yeah. came as a bit of a surprise. And the committee that determines these things apparently quoted the stock volatility. They didn't want such a volatile stock in their batch of, of 500 yeah. uh, stocks to determine the index. Um, and also competition concerns because GM announced its stake in Nikola to help uh, Nikola produce the badger. Um, so all of a sudden the competition is getting a little more real. Great. Plus but, Lucid Motors, Lucid Motors but, is in as well. Exactly. Uh, but year to date, Tesla is still up about 300%, um, but you know, year on year. Let's let's just a little quick market capitalization reminder. Even with that tanking price, it's at $346 billion. Yeah. Toyota, which is arguably a much safer stock, is at <laughs> $217 billion. Uh, well, that correction so, may have <clears throat> some way to go. Let's put it that way. Yeah, I think so too. And I, look... To, to, to think that Tesla itself is actually worth that much more when it just makes the cars... Like, if, if it was licensing its battery tech out to everyone, it'd yeah. be worth that. Yeah. I think a big yeah. chunk of that is investment analysts not doing as much homework as they should be oh, on yeah. autonomous driving. And they are drinking the Tesla Kool-Aid yeah. on... Yeah. We're going to be the leaders in autonomous driving. That's my it, view. Exactly. It's the price yeah. of the hype. That's yeah. the, 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 the share value of the hype. It's very yeah. high. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But um, look, with that, I think we have reached the finish line. I want to say thank you, Peter. And oh, my pleasure. Thank you, Richard. Thank you. Thank you. And thanks to our digital truth bomb, director of first impressions and slave to the rhythm, Mr. Pritchard, <laughs> for his prowess on the buttons and sliders. Today, he's wearing a T-shirt saying, I'm not a doctor, but I'll take a look anyway. <laughs> Hence, marked... <laughs> Pants marked police line, do not cross, and 24 karat gold genie shoes. Absolutely I always amazing. Look, look. I always look forward to what Pritchard is wearing. Yeah. Please pass on the word about yeah. the podcast and let us know your thoughts by searching for Cars Guide on Facebook and Instagram using the hashtag CG Podcast or email us at comments at carsguide.com.au. If you're an Apple Podcast listener, please rate and review us. And remember, you can watch us on YouTube. But before we go, one of my neighbours is uh, a bit odd, and he proved it yet again this week. Uh, I sensed some commotion out on the street a couple of nights ago, and sure enough, there were several police cars out there. So as I got closer to have a look, I overheard one of the cops talking to my neighbour, and I heard the cop say, seen anything unusual? The neighbour said, uh, a dolphin with a cigar once. And the cop said, I mean, around here. And they said, no, they live in the water. <laughs> that was very good. That was very good. <laughs> Excellent setup. That's fantastic. <laughs> um...